All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode number six of the Zyori Breakdown. Today we are going to look at some solo mid action. What can we do as good pub players to win the mid lane? have a whole lot of cool examples to look at today. We actually have the most replays that we've ever had on the Zyori Breakdown in one episode. We're going to look at three separate replays today, but we're only going to look at that little sliver in the early section. We're going to look right about the 10 minute mark is where we're going to get bored and move on to the next one. So we have some really cool replays. Big shout out to the team. It's Ghost for hooking me up. Dark Wanix and Haxorin were both kind enough to give me uh, some solid replays of themselves playing uh, to kind of demonstrate these points a bit more clearly. Also, a big shout out to Catlo Main as well. He uh, gave us a nice, uh, a nice replay. The last one we're gonna look at actually. I'm not gonna spoil it quite yet, but uh, we'll see when we get there. It's really, really an exciting replay. So we have a lot of cool stuff to talk about today. So um, we're gonna start by breaking down the essentials. What do we need to have a successful solo mid experience? Because we see in competitive play a lot teams doing not. They don't always do that two one two. So there's a whole lot of other analysis we can do in the laning phase, at that pro scrim level where we see the two two ones and those crazy mid combos like Pebbles and Amphora, Glacius for Saken Archer. We don't really see that too frequently in the pub scene, especially in the lower brackets, the sixteen seventeen hundreds. It's just drilled in everyone's head that what we do is put one hero mid and that one hero is supposed to gank supposed to get every rune and supposed to win us the game it seems to be sort of the mindset that most people uh, at least uh, in my experience have uh, in the pub scene so we're going to look at that a little bit try to figure out why they feel that way and is that de necessarily the best mindset uh, like i said we're going to look at the, the the core essentials i think of having a successful mid experience and then we're going to look at each one of those essentials uh, individually and uh, the replays overlap a little bit i don't have the replays stuck in these really clear sections like all right this one talks about starting items this one's just about wards um but they all do a little bit of everything so each one we're going to talk about um Kind of separately, so it should be pretty cool. The first thing I want to talk about today are wards, and uh, we actually have a little bit of ward action in some of these replays, but we do have some fantastic images I found via the intranet, and uh, we're going to take a look at these wards. So first things first, I suppose we should go over here. What are the core things we need to have a successful mid? And again, this particular episode is focused on the lower brackets. Right now, we're really talking about 1600 games where players have their mechanics down. Your teammates aren't that bad but they're not really that good either this tends to be the bracket where people think they're a lot better than they actually are where everyone thinks they know exactly what's going on they know exactly how the game works they know exactly what the metagame is all about they know what every role is supposed to do yet they've never really watched a competitive game they never really thought about it too deeply and they tend to get locked into that mindset of things that you have to do and as we've talked about in previous breakdowns and i think most of us are pretty well aware uh, by most of us i mean those of us that watch and uh, listen maybe agree on some level to uh, some of the things i I say but you know heroes of new earth and games in the moba genre in general are games of a high amount of variety there's very little that you have to do in every single game um you know as, as far as item builds or how you play a specific hero or how you lane or what you do at certain points of the game i mean the, the basic mechanics we all have to do well um but you know everyone says the biggest thing is mid has to gank we're going to spend a lot of time looking at well how much are those early kills really worth there are so many situations where it's better just to sit in that lane and soak up farm or push the lane or let the other person roam around while you get free farm there's so many situations where that is what you should be doing in mid instead of running around trying to set up ganks and uh, we're going to take a much closer look at that later on so upon some reflection i came up with four really basic essentials to have a successful mid experience and some of them are more important um, than others i said number one here we have rune control and again that's not necessarily you controlling the rune but your team controlling the rune you need to have some sort of communication to figure out what you're doing whether you're going to control that the runes your side lanes are your jungler is going to control it At the very least preventing the other team from picking up the runes your runes your mid hero does not necessarily have to be the one to do it but your team needs some sort of rune control strategy Second is you need some sort of warding. You need at least one ward on one of the runes. The bare minimum, the early stage of a game, is to have that one rune ward up. You need to know where that rune is going to spawn so that whoever it is on your team that you decide will control it, or whether it be uh, will be a handful of you, you need to know where it is and to be able to control it effectively. Number three, you need to make sure your hero in mid 
is in some way, shape, or form advantageous to your team, whether that is you have a farmer mid and you have really strong lanes and your melee is going to be able to farm up the mid, whether you have a great ganker mid, someone that has better rune control than, your, than their opponent, someone who's just a better mid hero, maybe a hard counter to that person in mid, you know, a rampage versus a soul stealer. If you have the rampage, you sure as hell better put him mid because he works quite well against soul stealer, things like that. So uh, there's a, a whole, that, I mean, that's a whole uh, another can of worms, I guess, but uh, that will come into play in these replays as well. The last one I talked to, uh, sort of is lumped into the third one, Lord, but we need some sort of lane control, whether, again, it's your hero has superior mobility so you can get to the runes faster, some sort of a great escape mechanism so that you can, um, you know, avoid death, some really great pushing ability so you can constantly pressure the lane, force them back, force them into their tower, or whether it be just the ability to farm very effectively. You know, Soul Stealer with this demon hands, he's one of the best farmers uh, there is, especially in the early stages when you can burst down those creep waves. So you need something to control that lane in some way, shape, or form to make yourself an effective mid-hero. So the first one we're going to tackle, and kind of the easiest to understand, uh, sort of easiest for the, this little streaming situation here, we're going to look at wards. So like I said, I found this fantastic website, and I actually closed it. I'm going to have to put the link in the VOD later so you guys can check it out. But I found, I just through Googling, I think it was allthingsnewearth.com, I found uh, some really great pictures of uh, rune ward action. It wasn't just rune wards, but those are the ones that I picked out. And of course, the, the hero they use in the example is Vindicator. So naturally, we had to we had to use that. I mean, there's there's no other... Uh, th there's no way I couldn't see the Vindicator pictures and just not work them into the, to the breakdown somehow. So let's go ahead and take a look at these pictures just as a refresher. You know, as always, I like to give a lot of information. A lot of, you know, people have told me some of the things I say are a little, a little basic. I would rather assume that you guys know nothing than assume that there are people out there that know things and they don't. So we always start at the bottom and work our way up from simple to complex. So we're going to look at all these different ward positions. Like I said, for most of you, this should be pretty straightforward and things that we already know. Unfortunately, the way these pictures are, you can't see my mouse pointer. So I'll have to guide your eyes verbally Follow the soothing sounds of my voice um, but we are just gonna look at these words let me actually make this a bit bigger for myself there we go so pretty straightforward your rune ward up in the top lane of course gives you a vision of the choke point up at the top up near the ancients for the legion side and gives you sight of that rune very standard warding situation uh, sort of contrapositive down here in the bottom lane you can put it on the hellborn side of the river or the legion side of the river but still gives you a vision of some of those choke points the hellborn um, Ancients, and then of course a site of the rune as well. Very the, the, kind of the two basic rune warding spots, if you will. Down here, a great rune warding spot that you can do for that bottom lane. If you're on the Hellborn team, it works great to prevent ganks from mid, or if they have a jungler. You get sighted that little choke point right behind those trees in the lane and also gives you sight of the rune. So this is a really handy ward spot that seems to be underutilized a little bit. It really works very effectively if the Legion team has a jungler of sorts. Down here in the bottom lane as well, this nice little, uh, I guess a little hill here you can call it, does give sight of that rune and gives sight of this huge access point down to the river and then the two ramps leading into the Legion jungle. Yet again, fantastic if the Legion has an obnoxious jungler that you want to try and pick on or at least slow down a little bit. Works very well. The kind of motif here between these warding positions is that you want to place your ward so that you can see the rune but also give your team some additional intel in the way of, hey, you can see the access points here. You can see when someone is coming in to try and set up a gank in the bottom or down in the mid or up in the mid lane uh, things like that again very basic stuff we've all probably seen these warding spots before um, in some way shape or form whether we really thought about it or not we see here yet another one down in the bottom lane on the edge of that ramp it does indeed stretch all the way down to the rune just barely but it will give you sight and again nice little access points for the mid it makes it nice and easy and then again the kind of contrapositive of that as well uh, here in the top lane at the edge of that ramp, it will indeed give you sight of that rune. And of course, there are plenty of other places you can plant wards that will give you sight of the rune and also great access points. There's one up in the top lane on the, to the left side of the river. Um, but again, very, very basic. I just wanted to give us all some visual... Um, uh, something visual to think about while we're talking about wards. Just uh, just in case one of those is new, that's great. Um, they're all really good places to throw wards. So... We're gonna. We're actually. We're gonna stop talking about wards now. We're gonna look at them in in the game. There's really not a hell of a lot more that we need to talk about about wards without uh, going into the even more basic of, of what wards actually do. So the next thing I want to talk about are starting items. And starting items are unbelievably important. And that will segue very nicely into our first replay with Dark Wanix. 
the trick to starting items in solo mid is you have to find that balance between your ability to last hit and your regeneration. So obviously mid lane is all about farming, well for the most part. So you need to do something to up that base damage. You can constantly see people picking up minor totems, using them picking up the base plus three intellect or plus three agility or plus plus three strength items. Um, you see people picking up hatchets if they're melee. You need some way to enhance your ability to last hit creeps. You need to give yourself somehow of an advantage or at least stay on par with uh, the opponent you're coming up against. That's why you never want to start bottle first in the mid lane. Um, it's most, it seems that used to be something people would try a lot and uh, I actually really haven't seen it too frequently. Um, it's only the people that don't talk and are, seem confused anyway that try that bottle first. But I mean, you can do it in certain situations, but as a general rule of thumb, we really don't see people going bottle first anymore because it just doesn't work as well. Um, and again, the bottle throws off that balance of your regeneration and your last hitting abilities. So generally we see people and you know, when I've streamed in the past, people in chat have said, dude, you don't need that much regen. You don't need two sets of tangos and a health potion. You're not, you're just not going to need it. You're either going to get bursted down before it becomes useful or you're just not going to use it and it's going to get thrown away, which is completely true. So again, a hatchet is a great way to do it. And just those uh, starting um, plus stat items work quite well. Obviously, you know, you have to find that balance because if you get out harassed, you're going to get pushed out of the lane and you'll lose the lane and allow the other person to farm. And if you just simply get out farmed because you can't last hit as well as they can, um, you know, you're not going to be able to get your bottle if that is what you need and it, uh, that can also result in a loss for mid. One of the items that's talked about a lot and used fairly frequently is the iron shield or the buckler, whatever you want to call it, that item that the, uh, the kind of the, the staple of the Helm of the Black Legion that mitigates that uh, little bit of damage early on. Of course, an item like that doesn't scale quite as well, so it's most effective in the early stages. It blocks a straight 20 damage 60% of the time. So that means that 20 per damage is a higher percentage of the total damage incoming very, very early on, because the, the base damage of a hero is not going to be lower than it is in the early stages. So if you're going to get a buckler, if you're going to go up against a hero that is going to be harassing you consistently, it's always a good pickup. I mean, of course, the base example is anytime you're a melee hero going up a ranged hero, you can kind of assume that they're going to be harassing you much more than you're going to be harassing them. If the opposite is true, then either uh, they're, you're doing something brilliantly or they're just really, really confused. So you have to think at the beginning of a game, the, again, this idea of people get locked into this habit of saying, okay, I'm going to get a hatchet, a shield, and, and a set of tangos. Every game, I'm going mid. That's what I'm doing. You see people do it on Deadwood, Nomad, what have you. Sometimes that really, truly is the best thing. It prevents you from getting harassed. It gives you a huge amount of, uh, of ability to last hit effectively, and you have that needed bit of regen, and generally one set of tangos is going to be enough because the damage mitigated from the buckler is more effective than just picking up extra regen and not getting the buckler. Great. We've established that that works in some situations, like a pyro versus a nomad. That's a great starting uh, starting set for a nomad. But if you look at their heroes and you're like, hmm, who are they going to put mid? I think it's going to be Deadwood. Maybe you don't need the buckler. Deadwood's actually not the best example because the buckler would work well. But the point is, you don't always have to pick up those same core items. You need to look and be a little bit more adaptable. Think, hmm... Will he actually be harassing me, or am I going to be going up against a very defensive hero in mid? Um, very important thing to think about. Another aspect of starting items that's important is you don't always have to spend all of that 600 gold. This is another thing um, that comes up kind, somewhat frequently, and we see it more in competitive play than not. But sometimes you'll see people just pick up the base items, maybe a couple of minor totems and a piece of regen, because their goal is just to get that bottle as fast as possible, especially a mana-intensive hero where you're going to be harassing quite frequently. You know, any sort of a caster, uh, Wretched Hag is an okay example of this. Um, it, it's not the the worst idea to not use all that money, save up, and just get that bottle a little bit more quickly. Especially if you aren't confident in your ability to out farm the uh, the opposing hero to get that bottle by the two minute mark. Um, you know, saving some of that gold to get to that faster bottle is an appropriate strategy at times. Um, so, without much further ado, let's actually move in to the first replay we have here. And uh, let me clear off my screen, and we will go ahead and move into 
replay number one. So here we are. I'm just going to give us a little bit of background about what is going on in this game. We're at the very beginning point here. We see 19 seconds in. The creeps are just coming in for the first time. So this was the replay submitted by Dark Wanix. Again, thank you very much, kind sir. As we can see, it is a Deadwood versus a Maraxxus. Let's go ahead and just let it play. So we're going to watch about the first 10 minutes, give or take. Um, and we're going to look at what's going on and figure out exactly uh, who goes right and who goes wrong. So we take a look at starting items here. Dark Wanix picks up this um, this really standard set, set that I talked about, the hatchet, the iron buckler, and the set of regen, whether it's a set of tangos or a health potion, um, you know, sort of personal preference. Um, but regardless, that same concept. Marax is doing something kind of similar, but at the same time, very different. He's picking up the double regen, the hatchet, and then three minor totems as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at the base damage, and of course, Deadwood, one of the reasons why he's such a great mid-hero, amongst some other reasons, is that huge amount of base damage with that Oak Bolt ability. Picking up the tree gives him that huge amount of base damage, and with the hatchet, uh, he's very difficult to last hit. So what's really interesting about this game, and one of the reasons why you know I looked at it, because there's a thousands of games that I could have picked here that have solo mids that are really interesting and this kind of stuff. And what's cool about this one is we see Maraxxus actually has a bit of an advantage over Deadwood. Most people would contend that Maraxxus is the hero that should win this lane against Deadwood. All things equal. What's that uh, economic term? Satyrus Parabum or whatever it is. Uh, you know, all things equal, Deadwood should not win this lane. Which might not be that intuitive because Maraxxus isn't a hero that we see all that frequently in general and most notably we don't really see him in mid all of that often. In this game we're gonna end up seeing Maraxxus lose mid and it's not necessarily because of um, you know hero mechanics more so just some silly plays that get made but there are still some really great points that we can look at as the game continues to go on. As we see Dark Wanix is uh, pretty much annihilating him at the moment the way of harassing him out of the lane and part of the reason of that is the Iron Buckler here that we see um, sitting in his inventory. I actually talked to Wanix about this a little bit when he was telling me about the replay and like you know why I should show it and what things are good about it and what's so special about Maraxxus Deadwood mid. And he said picking up the Iron Buckler was really key here because he can expect that Maraxxus is going to be trying to harass him down in this melee versus melee situation. Maraxxus is so great against Deadway, Deadwood because one he's pretty tanky. He's going to be able to absorb some of that harassment Deadwood can throw out. But most importantly, against any melee hero, Maraxxus serves as a little bit of a counter because of the more axes, or the, um, where is it, there is, more axes ability. You can't really run away from him. As a melee hero, you're on top of each other, you can't really get away from him, and that AoE stun makes, uh, is very powerful against the melee hero, obviously, because if you run up to the creeps, Maraxxus can just go ahead and uh, drop down uh, th that stun, and you're kind of screwed, I guess you could say. So, um, you know, again, all things equal, Deadwood should not be able to win this lane. So we're going to move into this idea of rune control here. When is it best to leave your mid lane, and when is it best to soak up that free farm? So right now, Deadwood has left the lane. If we take a look at the warding situation, it's uh, kind of a lucky guess, and uh, we don't have fog turned on at the moment because of... Um, I had to tab out of the game, but uh, regardless, we'll kind of ignore that. We see a ward for the Legion team, no ward for the Hellborn team. Deadwood does not know that the rune is top at the moment. A lucky, lucky guess. So he moves top, goes to pick up the rune. Mara Mar the rune. Uh, Maraxxus can see it, but he doesn't go for it. So this whole time, Maraxxus is going to be picking up free farm, while Deadwood is just running around, not doing a hell of a lot. If we look at the farm differential right here, Maraxxus sitting 11 and 1, Deadwood sitting 12 and 5. Their GPMs very comparable. 250, 240, very close. So what we're going to see here is Deadwood go up and pick up the rune. He's going to uh, go ahead, fill up his bottle, regen all the way, very, very nice. And we're going to see a potential gank, uh, well, sort of coming from Cthulhu. I'm not really sure what Cthulhu was thinking here. But they're going to be able to pick up this kill on the Cthulhu fin, no problem, easy peasy. So let's go ahead and pause it here. Right now, what, the first thing that went through my mind when I saw this in the replay was like, wow, well this is kind of stupid. Deadwood's going to win mid now because he just picked up a free kill. He didn't get the last hit, but still, uh, you know, getting that free kill, gets that extra experience, he's going to be able to win mid. You know, like Wanix, stop sending me replays to make you show off. Yeah, you look good, you won mid, but that's because Cthulhu fin fed you a free kill. That was my first thought. But then upon further investigation, 
Actually, we can let Deadwood come back to lane. And if we take a look at the GPM difference here, Deadwood at 280, Miraxis sitting at 260. He doesn't have that much of a boost that he had a few moments ago, and especially now that Miraxis has picked up those last few, last uh, the, the last couple last hits there. They're really, really close. XP differential, they are on the money, almost identical. So all of that time that Wanix spent moving around the lane, picking up the rune, I don't want to say it was wasted time, and because he had a bottle, he was able to pick up the rune. But the issue is, what the point that I want to emphasize here is, what are these early kills actually worth? That worked out for Wanix because Cthulhuffin sort of wandered his way down and handed Deadwood a kill. But in a situation where, let's say, Cthulhuffin was maybe up here, or all the way over here, and Deadwood would have had to walk all the way around and all the way back to the mid, he might not even be ahead of Miraxis after allowing Miraxis to free farm in that lane. So this emphasizes that point of, does mid always have to gank? How efficient is it for your mid hero to actually leave the lane and gank, knowing that the person you're leaving behind is just simply free farming? Right here we see a clear demonstration of why Miraxis should be able to take out Deadwood. Easy peasy, but uh, again, we see a pretty serious blunder right here. And, um, well, Deadwood actually picks up the kill. We see Miraxis is very upset about it. We run it back. We can actually watch this one in slow motion because it's a pretty... Uh, it, it speaks to two points. One, why Dark Wanix is a pro player, and two, why Miraxis is a better mid hero. We see they're both at uh, relatively full health, high mana. Miraxis is going to harass with the axes, drop the big stun, and Deadwood is in trouble. Well, actually, he hasn't stunned yet, but uh, the stun is coming. Well, we can see Miraxis should have picked up this kill. This should have been an easy peasy kill for Miraxis, no problem. And especially with Cthulhu coming in, Dark Wanix obviously handles himself very, very well. Ticks the bottle in between auto attacks. Oh, Dark Wanix, this is some brilliant mid play. Cthulhu Finn obviously conceding that early kill. Not the brightest bulb on the tree, misses the trample. And if he didn't have a haste rune here, he would have died. A nice alt turn, the tower smacking away. Uh, but the haste rune actually will serve as uh, the saving grace for Cthulhu in this situation. So now Wanix has a pretty serious advantage. Now if we look at that XP differential, he's leagues ahead. We look at the gold differential, we see Cthulhu actually comes in and finishes him off. So, um, you know, that will help level it out a little bit. The difference though, of course, Deadwood getting the solo experience for taking out Miraxis, and Miraxis not getting any of that experience. He did get the assist, so he got a little bit of a gold boost, but um, Dark Wanix is still uh, pretty far ahead. Now this is the other part in this replay that I want to talk about as far as um, yes, we see Miraxis lost mid. That's not really the point of this first replay. But more so the decision making from this point. So let's think about this for a second. We know that Miraxis is losing mid now for one reason or another. He's been killed and he just missed a kill. So he's now behind by at least one level, probably at a level and a half. He's level six, Deadwood, or he's level five, Deadwood's level six. He's obviously behind in farm, and if we actually take a look at items, the items are still pretty much the same. Wanix does have enough for boots, but the items are still pretty close. They both have a bottle and those core starting items. So what does Miraxis do? What would be the best course of action for Miraxis in this situation? Is it to just go back in lane and try to farm, hit that level 6, and just keep going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Deadwood? Or is it to do what he does right here, which is go down to the bottom lane and try and set up a gank at level 5? So let's go ahead and look at how this gank plays out, and then we'll kind of talk about this decision-making process. As you can see him miss the axe on Demented Shaman, he's moving on forward, harassing with Magmus, or harassing his thing on the Magmus, misses his Quake, Miraxis is just all over the place, this, oh gosh, pardon me, this game, Demented Shaman with a nice heal, they turn it around, and Miraxis just gets dropped like he's hot, Midas is not paying attention, awful, awful play for the Legion team. So, we, we're, we're going to look at this as, wow, that was a dumb play from Miraxis, he's an idiot, okay, that's one thing. But we're not going to look at it from the perspective of, wow, he shouldn't have died right there. There was nobody backing him up. He probably had a chance at killing one of them had he landed any of his abilities. Those things are all true. But the core problem here is, what happened if this went right? What happened if Miraxis went down there, his master plan was, all right, great, we're going down Midas, now we're going to kill Demented Shaman. I'm going to bring this back because I'm going to pick up a kill that'll give me enough experience to hit level 6, and then I'm going to go back mid and try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Deadwood. And after I pick up that kill will be in good shape. I'll roam through the bottom, hopefully the rune will be there, and I'll be back on track. That's probably fairly close to his train of thought, at least we'll give him the benefit of the doubt that that was his train of thought. The biggest issue with that, though, is that he doesn't have any boots yet. 
And that's one of the reasons why I question the, the line of logic as far as mid has to gank as soon. Every rune should be a gank unless it's an illusion. That mindset just doesn't work because of the, the idea of movement speed. At this point in the game, the only person with red boots uh, is Deadwood. Well, Magmus just picked up his as well. But, um, you know, Deadwood was really the only one to get those red boots. So Moraxis, even if he picks up that kill, he's still going to have to run all the way back to the mid lane. He's not going to be able to port because he just ported bottom. He's not going to want to waste the gold to port mid again. And this whole time, if we take a look back at the replay, Deadwood's just free farming mid. He's still leagues ahead of Moraxis in experience, gold, every way, shape, and form. So really my contention is that even if everything went perfectly for Ma Moraxis down there, and I use perfectly uh, lightly because I don't think they would have been able to pick up both those kills on Magmus and Demented Shaman. So by saying perfectly, I mean pick up a kill on one of these heroes and then roam back mid and hopefully pick up a six minute rune. Would that still have been an effective play? Because Dark Wanix is still free farming. I, I think we would have seen Moraxis get close to the mid lane just about right now. If you look at, take a look at the stats and take a look at creep kills, we see Deadwood has a, a nice advantage over him, sitting 25 and 8 versus the 18 and 3 of Moraxis. So that's really the core point um, of this replay. Let me see here. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue watching mid-section here. There's going to be another play coming up that will kind of demonstrate the, the idea of these two heroes and, again, the idea of how Moraxis should counter melee heroes. One of the other things I want to talk about a little bit in this breakdown, though we only have a couple examples of it, the idea of these heroes that serve as mid-counters that we don't always think about as mid-counters. Moraxis being one of them, uh, he needs to learn how to hit those axes a little bit more effectively, but uh, still the point is that Moraxis works uh, as a great semi-counter to any melee hero. You know, you're nomads, your deadwoods. We saw how much damage he was able to do dead due to deadwood in that earlier attempt, uh, you know, that failed gank when Cthulhuffin came in. Here we're going to see a pretty serious blunder from Araxis. He's going to move up and just hand a kill to Deadwood. Cthulhuffin's going to miss the stun again. Cthulhuffin, you sneaky snake. And uh, I think Cthulhuffin ends up getting killed here as well. Oh, no, perhaps not. They don't chase him down. So uh, I guess, well, for the hell of it, let's just go ahead and see exactly what Moraxis did here that was so wrong and really what he did so wrong. Oh, I didn't run it back quite far enough. What he did here, he's in great shape. Deadwood has a lot of mana, but low on health, a couple of bottle charges. This is the mistake that he makes. Look at his mana. 100 mana to use the ultimate, which as we know adds an added layer of survivability, but also does a huge amount of burst damage, and he has enough mana for another... Well, he has enough mana for one of anything. He can throw another axe. So what does he decide to do? Moraxis decides to throw an axe. And now he doesn't have enough mana for that ultimate. Deadwood's going to turn, punch him in the face. Down he goes. Easy peasy kill for Dark Wanix. So at this point, mid is beyond lost. Uh, Dark Wanix is totally just destroyed Moraxis, and uh, I don't want to say the game is over at this point, because this game actually ends up going on for about an hour. Um, but, you know, Dark Wanix just snowballs that much more effectively. Because at this point, what's so great about Dark Wanix is, from his perspective now, is that he can just roam as much as he wants. He doesn't have to worry about controlling the lane. He doesn't have to worry about, oh, if Moraxis comes back, he's going to free farm while I'm running around. He's already so far ahead of Moraxis that he can afford he can afford to take that risk and try and set up some ganks around the map. And, of course... You know, being the highest level in the game, Deadwood, one of these heroes, as we've talked about so many times, that needs those early levels. The earlier, the more experience he can get early on, the easier it is for him to snowball. And we'll see him pick up these runes and just start cruising around the map and set up some kills. So, again, the the point of this, the takeaway from this game is not to look at it and say, wow, there were some really big mistakes made from the Legion team. You know, Cthulhuffin missing the stuns, Cthulhuffin handing over that first kill, Moraxis going down bottom and just basically handing over a free kill. Those are all things that happened, and of course, um, they're important as to why Dark Wanix was so successful in the mid lane. But the real takeaway is, even if those things went well, were, were those the best decisions? Is that mindset of, well, I'm just going to go bottom and try and gank something. Does that mindset always work? And I would contend that it indeed does not. It does not always work. So we're going to move on to the next replay here in just a moment, so you're going to have to give me a second to load it up because it takes my Han about 45 minutes to load a replay. Let's see, you replay, there it is. This next one is a little bit more interesting and a little bit more even. And before we get into this one, I want to talk about the idea of rune control just a little bit. So we'll wait for this replay to load in so that I can pause it. We don't hear all of those awesome hero picking sounds in the background. 
and single draft and there we are so let's take a look at this idea of rune control and this replay coming up is one of the better ones and it's actually a really really good for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about once we get in there so the idea of rune control as we all know it's pretty damn luck based 50 percent to spawn in the bottom lane 50 percent chance to spawn in the top lane. so it's a lane so it's a complete crapshoot and i was actually had the opportunity to talk to hackster in a little bit today and that's one of the things i've been trying to do before breakdowns um you know, see if any of the pros have a little bit of insight because I found more often than not people are really eager to help and they're just you know the the pros in Han know so much about this game and they don't have an opportunity to talk about it. you know in Starcraft there's all these talk shows all these people trying to do interviews so pros it's the opposite you know they have a lot to say but there are too many places for them to speak and they they want some time to themselves but Han's the other way around everyone's just really eager to like oh man I have this awesome replay but nobody saw it you want to show people my replay please dude and they'll sit there and they'll tell you all about it and this is why I did this and it makes my job a lot easier and uh, makes me a little more confident that I'm saying the right things and not just hoping that I'm saying the right things so uh, it's pretty cool pretty damn cool I'm excited I, it's really cool that the pros uh, like kind of like this idea and they're like yeah man just like throwing me replays dude this game ID check it out it's really it's a, it's a good feeling it puts a smile on my face so anyway, the idea of rune control, very luck based, and this is one of the reasons we're seeing a little bit of a shift in the metagame. We see Pebbles mid quite frequently. He's one of those kind of staple mid here. It's like, oh, he's a great mid. He gets a bottle, gets those runes, picks up those farm, picks up that farm. From the information that I've gathered, we're starting to see that shift where we're seeing Pebbles less of a mid hero and more of a side lane hero, being uh, farming kind of like a carry, getting a nice support, getting a, a you know an Amphora, a Demented Shaman, a Glacius that just babysits him and he soaks up all of that farm. Because up in that top lane, if you can control that lane with a double stun, allow Pebbles to get all those last hits with that huge base damage and that hatchet. You can see him snowball actually much more effectively than you can in the mid lane because you take luck out of the equation. It has nothing to do with luck anymore. It has to do with your composition up in the top lane, your ability to stack your stuns, Pebble's ability to last hit. And if you're in uh, the, the easy lane, you know, the, the lane that's pushed to your tower, that can actually work quite well because the mid lane is so scary. Not only because if you don't get the rune, your opponent gets the rune, they get a lucky regen, that should have been a kill, but they're able to regen up, or they get a double damage and turn something around. It's a very luck based lane because we don't know what rune is gonna spawn. So we're seeing very important heroes like Pebbles that need to snowball to really be effective, really be a super force and super effective in a game. In these sure lanes where they're gonna pick up that farm, normally where we would see a Mage Bane, and that's something Team It's Gosu does a lot. We see them run these compositions without any agility heroes, let alone one of those hard carries. So instead of putting up in that role where we would see a Demented Shaman Mage Bane, and we're just gonna let Mage Bane farm for the first 30 minutes of the game, we're seeing a Pebbles up there. But the advantage to that is Pebbles will be able to be uh, will be able to be a more effective hero earlier on. We don't have to wait for that 30 minutes for Mage Bane to get those core items. Pebbles just needs that 2K to get his portal key. He hits the level 11 and he is all over the place doing tons of damage and picking off squishy heroes left and right. We've seen it so many times in previous casts and all sorts of competitive games. Um, and one of the runes that I want to talk about in particular, you know, I mentioned a couple, you know, you can turn the tide with a nice regen. Haste is one of the runes that really turns the tide of the mid lane. Because we talked about in that last game about, okay, even though Meraxxus had a good thought to set up a gank in the bottom, it didn't go well. If it had well, would it have still been worth it? Having a haste rune changes the scope of that equation quite significantly because boots are out of the equation. You're running at max speed. You can go up to the top, set up a gank, and run back down to the mid. And you can do it in a very timely manner that turns the kind of turns the tables in that equation and the amount of time your opponent would have to free farm um, is significantly less just because of the speed so again the luck base uh, of those runes and there isn't really a situation where you can 100% be sure that you're going to get runes especially if you're up against someone with good rune control wretched hag is the first hero that comes to mind you know one of the again one of these staple mid heroes one of the great things about hag is her ability to control those runes so effectively the blink makes her extra mobile and you know assuming all things equal you both have sight on runes you mo both go on it right away hag will generally beat you there unless there's some other circumstance uh, you know there's another hero in the way or you're in some sort of really weird position um, so you know it can be hard even if you're doing well in the mi middle lane even if you're pebbles you're dominating you're picking up all the last hits if hag gets that one lucky rune it can turn the tides of that lane so rune control is unbelievably important 
And again, not just important in the sense of, I have to get every rune, but important, you need to make sure you know where the runes are going. Your mid hero doesn't necessarily have to be have to be the one to pick up the runes. You can have your side laners pick up runes. There are all sorts of other things you can do, but regardless, you have to make sure you know where they're going. Not having that rune ward early on is a game changer. And one of the things that comes to mind, that one sort of core piece of advice that I say to people all the time, and it never really seems to sink in, if you are a mid hero in a pub game, and no one on your team wants to buy you wards, just buy one yourself. That 100 gold investment will be worth its weight in gold. When you're getting your bottle, just save up 700, get that ward, and plant it. You're still going to have to guess at the first rune. It isn't ideal, but my biggest pet peeve in pub games is when someone goes mid and no one buys them a ward and they just sit there and complain about it for 15 minutes and refuse to buy one themselves. All you have to do is buy one. Once you buy one, you can say, hey, Glacius, I bought the first word. Could you please buy the second one? Glacius undoubtedly is going to have a higher frequency of saying, you know what, sure, buddy, I'll get that next rune. It's on the courier. Then if you just say, oh, my God, you're such a noob. You didn't buy a word. That's your job, Glacius. Most of the time, those people will just ignore you because they're confused anyway. They don't really care. They're just looking to play and have a good time. They don't really care about the mechanics. They don't care about the metagame. Quite frankly, they don't even really care about winning. They just want to go run around and kill stuff. So it's all about how you communicate. That first episode of the breakdown, communication, is so unbelievably important. I think we talked about that a little bit in that episode, but it's it, it plays into this one, so we'll bring it up again because it's just so fucking important, and it really bothers me to my core. Um, you know, again, uh, with rune control, side lanes can um, control the runes, and that can be advantageous. If you have a hero like Zephyr Mid, Zephyr is a carry hero. He just wants to soak up farm. A bottle on Zephyr is okay in very specific situations. I kind of prefer it, but it's not always the best because Zephyr is not a hero that wants to leave the lane. He wants the other person to leave the lane so that he can sit there and just soak up as many last hits as possible. That's Zephyr's main goal in the early stages of the game, especially in a mid lane. So if you can get some of your side laners to control the runes for you, that not only allows one of your side laners to pick up a bottle, which they otherwise wouldn't have been able to, you don't, generally you don't see, oh gosh, pardon me, two bottles on a team. It's really not that effective. There are some situations where we've seen it and it can work, but it's not the most effective thing in the world. So it does open up that opportunity for one of your side laners, especially if there's a pyro on one of your side lanes or a, a, a Zeus or something like that. It works very effectively. Effectively. And the other great thing is if your side laner, like Pyro, can pick up a rune, he gets an invisibility, he might even be able to come and set up a gank for you mid, then you can get a kill nice and early. And if you didn't have that rune, it otherwise probably wouldn't have worked. So there's a lot of advantages to allowing your teammates to help you pick up those runes and control them. And, uh, you know, another one of my pet peeves is when people refuse to gank mid in the early stages. People always say, you're mid, you should, you should be able to win, and you should be ganking for us, not the other way around. It's like, well, yeah, in an ideal world, I would destroy my lane and just carry this game, but we're not in an ideal world and you know I'm not I'm not testy I can't always do that and sometimes it's there are these brilliant opportunities for teammates to help you gank mid and they just simply don't especially if you're up against someone like a soul stealer with no escape mechanism do you know how easy it is to gank a soul stealer in the mid lane drop one stun on him drop a combo whatever it is two spells he has no way to escape he's dead easy peasy kill mid wins the lane and rune control really helps with that. So when I say it's important to have rune control, I don't simply mean that it's important that you as the mid hero picks up every rune. My point is it's important that your team in general make sure they know where the rune is going. Whether your team is able to control it or not, if everyone's in a weird position, you can't get the four minute rune, at least know what it is and who got it so you can prepare accordingly. Know that, okay, there's a pyromancer on the other team with an invis. Everybody get the fuck back. Understanding where these runes are and where they're going and what they're doing with them. Very, very important. We're actually going to see that in this game. And uh, I think that uh, actually is kind of a, enough of an intro, enough of my little spiel here to get going. And uh, let me just line up this replay. Oh, single draft. Yes, I know. Uh, God, I hate this replay counter. There we go. Alrighty. And... Do, 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 do. And here we go. Okie dokie. So let's get straight into it. So in this game, we will give a brief introduction yet again. In the mid, we will have the mighty It's Gosu Haxorin playing Wretched Hag going up against Bergen, the pink pyromancer. Blue versus pink. Two ranged nuker intellect heroes. A clash of the titans. This is an exciting mid lineup. It's actually really, really exciting. 
This is such a great game, and I'm really glad Haxren was able to, uh, well, to do it and tell me about it, because this turned out to be a fantastic demonstration of some of the topics that we just talked about. So first things first, let's look at the starting items before anything else. And actually, uh, let's see, where are we in the way of creep kills? Let's run it back just a little bit before we even see creep kills. So let's uh, take a look here. Hag doing something that I mentioned at the very beginning. It's not always the best strategy to spend all of your early gold. We see Hag still with 230 remaining gold from that starting money. Just getting the core items, a couple of quick pieces to help with that last hitting. No regeneration because he's not worried about being out harassed by Pyromancer. His whole goal, get that bottle as quickly as possible. He's trying to find that happy medium of, okay, what do I absolutely need to be able to have a chance at keeping up and less hitting with Pyro? And making sure that bounces out to get that early bottle. So already that, uh, that kind of concept is coming into play. Pyro kind of in a similar situation, although he did spend a bit more of that money and uh, picked up uh, some Runes of Blight. So let's go ahead and see how this one plays out, guys. So what's really interesting about this mid lineup is Hag versus Pyro. Who has the advantage? And I actually uh, did a little bit of an experiment and just to, you know, slash BM. Uh, so who should win a mid, all things equal, Pyro or Hag? The overwhelming response was Pyro. But there were a few people that were like, no man, Hag should win. Hag's, Hag's the best. I'm wretched Hag. And, um... It was kind of interesting just to hear, you know, everyone was giving me their, their two cents. It was really interesting. And, you know, I sort of had some thoughts, but I wanted to hear what everyone else had to say. And it's always good to get other opinions and uh, feel a little more confident about what I'm saying. It just proves my point so clearly. That little introduction I did in the very first breakdown of that all things in this game are subjective. Literally everything um, is just a matter of opinion. There are absolutely no absolutes in this game. So... Uh, as we can see, being demonstrated very clearly by this creep score, as we can see here, 4-2 to two compared to the 1-1, one to one, Hag has superior um, has a superior attack animation. So he has the ability to last hit a little bit more effectively. And we're seeing that here, not a big surprise. But Pyro, on the other hand, the big mighty Pyromancer, has a slightly better harass and uh, actually should be able to, to last hit a, or harass a bit more effectively. Although the attack animation makes it a little bit more difficult for those last hits. As we can see here, Pyromancer with a 600 range and Wretched Hag with a 550 range. So Hag is actually outranged just a little bit, which should give, her, give Pyro a nice little advantage. Of course, the other thing as well, as we just saw right there, the Phoenix Wave has a nice long range on it. And Hag's main nuking ability is within melee radius. Well, it's a bit longer, but you know what I mean. You have to be up in their face. So Pyro can do damage from a distance, whereas Hag needs to be up close and personal to do that additional bit of damage. Something else that uh, Haxorin so clearly pointed out to me also is that you can't afford to level Flash of Darkness too much early on for that one point because you're losing your nukes, uh, losing damage in your nuke um, when you do that. So it's very important that you still level up Solar Screen even though you can't use it to harass Pyro, but you can still use it to pick up a couple of creep kills. We see Hag picking up that bottle very quickly, Pyro picking up that bottle as well. We're going to see the idea of rune control come in momentarily. That first rune is down in the bottom lane. And let's pause it. Let's take a look at the warding situation. So our Hellborn team, Pyromancer, they've got the ward here on that little tiny island. Looks like uh, Cape May, if, for those of you that may live in New Jersey. That ward position that we looked at earlier on works so effectively. Gives you some uh, sight into the jungle and, of course, of the rune as well. The Legion team, they've got a ward up of their own. So Haxorin does know that the rune is not top, but he will opt to hand Pyro that first rune just to pick up some additional fun. Let me pull up my notes here just to make sure I'm not missing anything too important. Um, you know, the other thing, of course, uh, Pyromancer just has superior burst. He can insta-gib Wretched Hag pretty easily, especially once he hits, hits level 6. Hag, a very squishy hero. So Pyro versus Hag is an interesting matchup. It's scary for both parties. The other aspect as well, something I mentioned previously, is that Hag should have superior rune control. All things equal, Hag is a much more mobile hero and has the ability to get to those runes faster given that both these heroes leave the lane at the same time to get to that rune. We see Pyro is finally catching up in farm now that he has that double damage and able to just harass so effectively, Hag taking so much damage that Fervor is a great harassment as well. So right now you're looking at this and we're thinking, hmm, it's actually really even. Just by watching it, it feels like Haxorin is really struggling. It kind of feels like... Oh man, he's you know he's at half health. Pyro's at full health. The double damage, like oh he just he can't hurt. He right now he can't last hit as well. That double damage is turning the tides of this lane. 
And it is a little bit. I mean, Haxra isn't in the best of positions, but all, you know, given this, uh, this matchup, he's doing pretty damn well. And the fact that he didn't go for that rune allowed Pyro to take it. Now Pyro's caught up in some farm thanks to that double damage. But those few moments of free farm that Haxon had were so, so valuable. Again, playing back to that point of it's not always most effective to leave that lane and grab the rune. Sometimes it's better just to sit in the lane and pick, uh, pick up some of that free farm. So we saw Haxorn actually do something really interesting there, and we're going to run it back just a little bit. So we're at 359. The rune is yet to spawn. We don't know where it's going to be. It's not in the top lane yet. And Haxorn is already headed to the top lane, so he's trying to give himself a head start, recognizing that he has that superior, mobi superior mobility, even if the rune is bottom lane and he sees that he can still double back and get there at either the same pace or just slightly ahead of Pyromancer, so he is going to guess top, and then lo and behold, it is top, so he's going to be able to beat Hag there, we see Pyro is on the way, Pyro not going to get there, the blink going to make it easy peasy for Hag, unfortunately not really going to be able to do a hell of a lot with this invis, but let's pause it here as well, and let's evaluate the other opportunities that Hag has in this situation, does Haxorin make the right choice by eating that regen right away, taking a sip of the bottle and going back to the mid lane? What were his options? Up in the top, we see there's a Torturer pushed up pretty far. That's a pretty damn tempting Torturer right there. A lot of us would see that and be like, wow, he's pushed up. I could probably set up a gank here. We have great sight of the jungle. This could be an easy gank, and they could most certainly kill him. Although, keep in mind that Pyro did see Hag pick up the invis, so they have a good idea that Hag's invisible, and Torturer would most likely retreat back to the tower. So even though there is a lot of burst here, the uh, Magmus Valkyrie could do a lot of damage in tandem with that Hag, it still is the better choice to go back to the mid lane, because given the information that Torturer has, Haxorin would have to sit there for probably a good 30 seconds waiting for Torturer to pop back out, and then they might be able to set up a kill. All the while, Pyromancer is just free farming away in the mid lane. Just, again, that idea of you don't always have to gank. People will tell you in pub games, they will yell at you. They will tell you to commit suicide because you're not ganking. Saying that's all mid should do, that invisibility rune should have been a kill top. People will indefinitely continue to flame you for doing that. But it's not always the best choice. And when you see it stopped in a replay like this, it becomes kind of obvious. You're like, yeah, he'd have to run all the way up here. He won't be able to blink because he doesn't have boots. And this also plays back to that idea of making sure you know where the runes are. Even if your team isn't the one that's able to control them, Pyro moved up to the rune to see what it was and to make sure that Hag picked it up. He knew it wasn't bottom. So Pyro could have thought to himself, hmm, he's going to get the rune. He's going to beat me there no matter what. I don't even need to go there. I can just sit here and continue farming. But instead, Pyro makes the brilliant choice of going up to that lane just to see what the rune is. Had he not done that, Torturer wouldn't know that it was an invisibility, and Torturer may not have backed up if they don't see uh, you know, Hag come back momentarily. We're going to end up seeing Hag pop back into the lane in just a few seconds, but right away... Oh, I thought Torturer was going to back up right away. Um, and he doesn't really, I mean, he doesn't really push forward, but still, that, that point is, is very clearly illustrated right there, that Pyro moves up just to get sight of that rune to see what it is. It plays to the point of making sure you know where the runes are. What Pyro did there is still a form of rune control, not in the traditional viewpoint of he picked up the rune, their team is going to be able to utilize it, but he still has some control over what's happening in the situation. He knows what's going on. So the idea of saying my team needs rune control goes beyond just making sure your mid-hero leaves the lane to pick up every single rune. That is such an important point that I want to emphasize um, throughout this entire breakdown. So let's see the mid lane struggle continue here. The farm is actually very even. If we take a look at XP per minute, Pyro slightly ahead, gold per minute. Hag's actually slightly ahead, although it is remarkably even at this point in the game. But right now we see a little bit of the turning of the tides. Pyro now level 6. He's still in the lane, has full health, full mana. Hag is forced back to the well. And again, this is at first thought I saw this and I was like, wow, this is the turning point. Haxorin has just lost the lane. He's back at the well. Pyro is able to free farm. But Pyro does something really strange here, and I'm not really sure what the mindset is. I still am not entirely sure. He kind of does this weird loop around to see if he can catch anyone coming up in the jungle and ends up wasting all that time that he could have free farmed. So he could actually be even further ahead of Haxorin right now, but he's not. He kind of wasted that time moving around. Again, playing back to the point of why leave the lane. Free farm is free farm. Especially given that there wasn't going to be enough time to pick up that six minute rune. Which will spawn um, momentarily. So we will see. 
Tempest doing a nice move to go to the bottom lane to control it. Let's actually run this back and take a look at exactly what's going to happen here. We are at 557. So right now Pyro has sight on that bottom rune. We have that ward still down here. He cannot see where Tempest is. Hank has sight up in the top. Oh gosh, pardon me. So Pyromancer is going to guess bottom lane regardless of the fact that he has a ward. And that's something Hag did earlier on. So he's going to go down there and Hag is just going to stay in the lane knowing that Tempest already has that positioning. Tempest down there, he's going to see the rune isn't there. Pyro sees the rune isn't there and he just reverts back to the, uh, the mid lane. And Hag goes top and picks up that double damage. What Tempest did right there is a very key thing and something we don't see enough in games. Hey, or um, pardon me, Tempest is actually doing something that Pyro's team should be doing in this situation. Against a hero like Wretched Hag in the mid, where you can almost assume that Hag is going to pick up every single rune, all things equal, that the only thing the Hellborn team can do is just to guess every time. Put Pyro down at one rune and put. Um, one of their other heroes up at one of these other rooms. We're actually going to pause here and uh, talk about what's happening here in just a second. Um, so, but what Tempest was doing there is what Pyro's team should be doing. Again, in a situation where you're against a hag, where Pyro's thinking right now, okay, I sort of started to guess bottom lane to try and get a head start, but it's totally luck based. Hag should be getting most of these runes, so what can they do? The only, situ the only option they have is to send one of the Hellborn players top or one of the Hellborn's bottom. Pyro says, alright, I'm going bottom lane, Parasite, you go top lane. And they just get the rune. It's more important to prevent Hag from getting it than it is for Pyro to get every single rune. And he still has a 50-50 shot if he's one of the ones guessing. But instead, Tempest is the one doing that. He says, alright, I'll go to the bottom rune to make sure Pyro can't get it. Hag, you can go top or I'll try to protect it for you down in the bottom lane. That is such an important thing to do. It takes teamwork to control the runes. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to see the turning of the tides here in just a moment. So we're going to go back to the lane, or uh, to the game, and this is such a clear demonstration of that point we talked about earlier on in the way of mid is a gamble. Rune control is so variable. It's the most important lane in the game, but also has the highest degree of variance in the game. And this describes why so clearly. Hag picks up this double damage. Again, thank you to Tempest for going down to that bottom lane to scare Pyro away, uh, even though it spawned top anyhow. So Hag jumps in, drops the burst rotation, drops the slow. Pyro stuns him, but he's slow. The double damage comes in. Hag throws an auto attack. One more hit, and it's a sure kill. Pyro knows he can't do anything to get out and Hag is able to pick up that kill. So why was Haxor able to pick up that kill and get away with 15 HP? The only reason, literally the only reason, is because of that double damage rune. Pyro didn't make some horrible, terrible mistake. If we run it back, Pyro was arguably up maybe a little bit too far forward knowing that Hag has a double damage. But look at this positioning right here. You wouldn't look at this before knowing what just happened and say, wow, that Pyro is really out of position, or wow, that Hag's in a really good position. This is just a standard lane right now. We jump ahead half a second, or sorry, pardon me, five seconds, and all of a sudden Pyro is in big, big trouble. And it's that double damage rune that allows Hag to do that huge amount of damage. And Pyro actually almost survives. If he had moved around the trees a little bit, he may have been able to do it, but he thought that he could auto-attack him down, maybe at least finish him off with the fervor. Fortunately, it doesn't quite work out. But this goes back to the point of how important the runes are and why it changes the state of the game for the mid lane. That reason why we see heroes like Pebbles now taking more of a carry role than that solo mid hero. Uh, mid hero, Because even though Pyro was doing well in mid, he just lost it. If we look at the GPM now, Hag is way ahead of Pyro, 100 GPM ahead. We look at the XP per minute, Hag is a nice lead on him as well. He was able to do half the damage to the tower, and now Hag is able to pick up free farm for the next few minutes. Like That one kill was so crucial to the turning of the tide. We even saw earlier on, Haxorin was, if anything, struggling a bit in this lane. Pyro was doing a great job, doing a lot of damage, doing what Pyro does best. And even now, he's back in the lane, Hag playing very defensively as he has to. He's going to be forced back, but it doesn't matter. The damage has indeed been done. So we're going to take a look at the 8 minute rune, that rune that will spawn momentarily here, and we're going to kind of uh, see that point about Tempest and what the Hellborn team should be doing emphasized a little bit more clearly. So let's, uh, we're actually going to pause it right about as we get to that uh, 8 minute mark, so just bear with me for a moment here, and we'll do it to it. So. 
eight minutes. The ruin is now spawned. Let's take a look at the warding situation. This is really a key point in the game because that first initial ward has gone down. And this is the time in pubs when you see people say, oh, I bought the first ward. Someone will get the second one. And then no one does or someone forgets about it or they stop paying attention to the timer. And this is really a scary time. We see the Hellborn team actually does have a ward up still down in the bottom lane. Pyro uh, guesses top, obviously guesses wrong, sees it, heads down to the bottom lane, and again, Tempest is the one to pick up this rune. Tempest is so important to this mid lane. Again, one of the reasons Haxorin was able to be so successful, I mean, not to say Haxorin wasn't playing well or something like that, but one of the reasons he's been so successful against this Pyromancer, who, if anything, has been, you know, giving him a... a a good fight. We established Pyro should be a fairly stronger mid with his uh, improved range and higher amount of burst and the ease of his ability to burst down a hero like Hag. So Tempest has been on the money for the past three runes in a row. Tempest has been down there to say, all right, Haxorin, I'm either going to get the rune or protect it for you. I'm here, ready to help you. We see Pyro's team does nothing of the sort. No one on his team seems to have remote interest in helping him with these runes. The only thing that they've done is Chipper was nice enough to buy a ward for the bottom lane. That's absolutely all that they've done. They haven't helped him control these runes whatsoever. Meanwhile, Pyro had been doing that the whole time. Again, that idea of controlling the rune a little bit by giving Torturer that sight to prevent the, uh, invis the potential invisibility gank. Pyro is really not having good luck this game as far as teammates that want to help him out and teammates that want to win. So now we see Tempest with the haze. Tempest thinking about trying to set up a gank, but then just backs it on up. So we see Hag even left the lane to go regen. Hag said, you know what? I'm ahead in this lane. I just killed you. My bottle's empty. You can kill me right now. I'm just going to run back to the base. That's one of the big no-nos in Han. When you have a new friend and he's like, how do I play this game? What do I do? What's the plan? You say, all right, well, you don't want to take a lot of damage because healing you have to pay for and you don't want to go back to the well. That's like one of the first things I tell people. It's like, all right, well... You know, people that come from World of Warcraft, they think, oh yeah, my paladin will just heal me back up. It's like, no, dude, you have to pay to heal in this game, or you have to indirectly pay for it with the opportunity cost of sitting in the well. So Hag says, all right, well, I'm just going to run back to the well. Tempest covers him, helps him control the runes still. So now another little bit of decision-making goes on right here. Let's actually pause the game and evaluate the current state of this match. So again, let's take a glance at GPM. Pyromancer still leagues behind uh, good old Haxer in here experience same boat so now hag has really won this mid lane he's going to stay mid and just continue farming the lane now he's going to be able to push this lane this is a really important point that we're going to talk about coming up in the next replay quite extensively so but again let's think about the decision making from pyro he's mid hag comes back to the lane after getting the rune when does pyro leave pyro leaves right about now heads back to the well why does he go back to the well he walks all the way back to the well, and then he ends up going up to the top lane to try and set up a gank. Meanwhile, allowing Hag to just farm his little heart's content in the mid lane. Oh, okay, Pyro's going to buy his power supply because the courier was out. Uh, but he's going to port to the top lane. So now let's think about this. Is this the biggest mistake that Pyro could have made? Even if this goes according to plan and he picks up some kills, is he going to come out ahead than if he had just gone back to the mid lane? to try and uh, continue farming, slow down the farm of Hag, maybe even kill Hag. Because again, Pyro still has a huge amount of burst potential. He's lost this lane, but the beauty of a hero like Pyro, he can drop this rotation and do an absurd amount of damage, especially with that ultimate. I mean, he can easily solo down Hag right now, given that Hag has no magic armor. He does have the strength steam boots, but still, a scary time. I mean, Pyro is by no means a useless hero at this point in the game. So he goes up to the top lane, and... They don't, they're unable to set up a kill. We're going to have a little bit of a spoiler here. We'll actually just go to skip ahead for a second here. And, oh, God, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to go uh, fast forward. There we go. So Pyro's going to hide in the little trees here. Torture is going to go in. They're going to try and set up a kill on Valk. She's going to survive. Magnus will drop a stun, a nice juke. The three er second arrow going to come. So far, Pyro's not been able to do a hell of a lot. I'm not, I can't remember if they kill Magnus. I feel like they don't. And uh, there it is. Magnus is able to get away. Parasite unable to do a hell of a lot either. So now Pyro just wasted all of that time running to the top lane, and he's still wasting time. He's not going to cut his losses. They're going to continue going for it. Looks like they do end up setting up a kill on Valkyrie. Okay, so they do get the kill. That's actually really good. I, I, I guess when I originally watched this, I kind of skipped through it a little bit too quickly. So, but what did they trade for that to happen? That whole time Pyro was up top 
we saw Haxorn in the mid. He farmed another wave of creeps, and he took out the tier 1 tower in the mid lane. So now let's check the stats again. Where is Pyro compared to Hag, given what just happened? Hag even further ahead of Pyro than before that happened. Hag now ahead by 150 GPM because he got that tower kill. Pyro only got a singleton hero kill and plus Hag got all those creep kills as well. Experience, same situation. Hag is over 100 experience per minute ahead. Things went pretty damn well for Pyro up there. He even got the last hit. Unfortunately, they didn't kill Magmus. Had he gotten the double tap, would have been a nice little influx of gold, but not the same for the tower kill. Not only does that give Hag a lot of gold, but it also boosts his team. So things went pretty well for Pyro. He didn't get killed up there. They didn't completely whiff the gank, but he wasted a lot of time trying to set it up while Haxorin just sat in the lane and continued to make it happen. See, now we're going to see Haxorin come up here to the top lane. He doesn't get offensive to try and finish off Torture. Unfortunately, he's uh, you know not feeling that ballsy. He has an empty bottle, so he won't be able to sip the bottle to pick up the kill. But the point is the same here, that it's not always best to roam around and gank as aggressively as possible. Sometimes just sitting in that lane and farming is fantastic. If we've noticed, Hag has not ganked yet. If we look at this game, he's 1-0-0, and that one kill is from a solo kill in the mid lane thanks to a rune. In most lower pub games, say 1600, your team would be flaming you right now. If they're losing one of their lanes, this bottom lane, Hag, you're not ganking enough, we need your help, I can't handle this lane. Sometimes it's not best. All of that time that Hag spent in lane is was so effective. Had he spent more of that time moving around the map with the possibility of setting up ganks, um, it's really risky. It really doesn't have as high of an expected value as just hanging out in the lane and picking up uh, that extra bit of farm and picking up a tower kill. And, you know, of course, the contra of leaving the lane is exactly what happened right here. Hag was able to pick up that tower kill while Pyro got but one hero kill. But one hero kill. Demonstrated very clearly for us. So, I mean, the rest of this replay really isn't that important. Like I said, for all these replays, we're really just going to look at the first ten minutes. That's really all we care about today. The first ten minutes of these replays. But the point is still demonstrated pretty effectively right there um, about why you don't always want to leave. That's really the underlining tone throughout this entire breakdown is mid lane is not made to gank. That is not the core responsibility of the mid lane. You can win mid without ganking. And we saw it demonstrated right there uh, by Haxor against the Pyro. And this replay was a little bit nicer to look at just because we saw he didn't win because Pyro made silly mistakes. We didn't win because Pyro missed all of his stuns, missed all of his Phoenix waves, and uh, just sucked at last hitting. It was a fairly even matchup. If anything, Pyro, you know, I don't want to say played better than Haxorin, but, you know, had control of that lane pretty effectively in the early stages of that match. So demonstrated very clearly for us. So uh, this next little blurb I have in my notes is actually just a reiteration of what rune control ended up evolving into. I titled this portion Ganking Frequency. How frequently should we gank? How frequently should we stay in the lane? The idea of the haste rune, of course, is very important, something that I talked about earlier. That is the one difference of how, okay, maybe at the two-minute mark, if you get a haste rune, you might be able to set up a gank. And that the time difference it takes where being able to run at max speed versus not even having red boots really changes the state of that risk equation of, all right, well, what am I, or um, you know, the expected value changes significantly right there. What am I giving up? Well, I'm giving up free farm in the mid. How much farm am I giving up? Well, that's based on the amount of time I'm out of the lane. What am I gaining? Well, I'm gaining the chance to pick up a hero kill, and I'm gaining, uh, if I pick up that hero kill, my team will be able to free farm that lane until they respawn. So given that haste rune, you have an additional opportunity. It, it sways the equation a little bit to make it a little bit more favorable, but it still is a bit, a bit risky. Still not, uh, you know, that's not to say every time you get a haste rune, you should be ganking the nearest lane. But um, uh, you know, that is the point. I think we're all, all intelligent enough to comprehend what I'm trying to explain here. Um, let's just see. Yeah, that's actually the core part of this ganking frequency thing. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this next replay. This is actually perfect. Uh, things are falling. I love when things just fall into line. You know, I don't write a script for these, but I have pretty clear notes that uh, guide me in the right direction. So uh, it's always good when these things kind of fall into line. I always feel disorganized. I never feel like I'm really organized enough in expressing myself properly. And then after the breakdown, I sit there and think, oh my god, why didn't I say that? Oh no, oh, that would have been so perfect because that's just what I do. I'm one of those people that after I have an argument with somebody, I think of like a really witty combat after, or comeback after the conversation is already over. I'm totally one of those people. You know how frustrating it is to be one of those people? You feel like every conversation you have in your life is just like, wow, that conversation could have been so much better, but I fucked it up because I just, why didn't I think of that? I can think about it now. Why couldn't I think about it when they were talking to me? 
Oh god, one of the most frustrating aspects of my life. Um, so anyway, let's move in to replay number three. The last replay of the day, things are moving along ever so quickly. So we're going to see something very nice and interesting here. A Demented Shaman solo mid versus a Pe Pebbles solo mid. Now this is interesting for a mecha of reasons. One, we don't see Demented Shaman mid that frequently. Two, solo mid Demented Shaman is my favorite favorite thing in this game above anything else. And three, we talked earlier about why Pebbles is being transitioned into more of a side lane hero than a solo mid hero. So this demonstrates kind of why that is a little bit and also demonstrates the power of the Mighty Demented Shaman. So we are uh, at the 20 second mark. A big shout out to Cat Lomain for making this possible. Um, able to just play a nice Demented Shaman solo mid game. I know it took him a few tries uh, to get it right because uh, this actually goes perfectly. Let me, we're, actually we're going to go on a little bit of a rant here to start this one off. If you have a teammate, you join a game and someone says, I'm going to go with Demented Shaman solo mid, please do not flame them. It's really not as bad as people think it is. Demented Shaman is such a versatile hero and such a powerful hero. He doesn't have to be that babysitter, I get no farm, I get no last hits, I'm just letting Mage Bane soak up all the farm. He does fine in that role, mind you, but he doesn't have to play that role every single game. He is one of the most versatile heroes in the game, at least in my humble opinion. We'll see it demonstrated right here, but I mean, just even trying to get this replay serves as perfect evidence of that. Cat Lomain, uh, I think they had at least two remakes before this game. Uh, and, you know, These are all just pub games, solo queue pub games. Uh, all of these are, actually, all, all three of the replays today. And uh, twice in a row, his team voted to remake because they were like, oh my god, Noob Demented Shaman insists on mid, remake please, and the other team remakes. That bad that they, they, they're just like, this game's going to be ruined. Pink Demented Shaman, you cannot go mid. This is, you're an idiot. No. No, Demented Shaman, no. They remake the game. And then one of the games before this, he, they actually played it out, and uh, I don't think they won, and the team just yelled at him, and he said, I'm, I'm not having any fun. I think he, he might have ended up just leaving the game, I think, because his team was so mean to him. So hopefully this will serve as some evidence that this works pretty well. And this isn't a particularly low game. Let's actually stats Cat Lomain, but, I mean, he's not, um, you know, he's, he's a 1750 player. So this isn't, you know, some 1500 game, you know, we're not going to look at this and be like, oh, well, he won because this is 15, I mean, 1500 Pebbles, what does Pebbles know? It's pink versus blue, 1750 game. So keep that in mind as we go through this replay, because it's really, really important. So let's go right here and get straight into it. So let's take a look at the starting items. Pebble's going to go with that hatchet and a couple of those last hitting items as we talked about. And of course, the Mark of the Novice, very important for those of us that understand Pebbles, gives him enough of a mana pool so that he can combo earlier on than if he didn't have that plus in item. So it's very important as well. Um, you know, for those of us that don't play Pebbles too frequently, that does not help his base damage, but Pebbles one of these heroes with that absolutely huge base damage, and uh, the hatchet makes him very difficult to outlast hit. So, why is Demented Shaman such a good mid? We'll look at his starting items too. Cat Lomain may have gotten a bit of the over-regeneration as we talked about earlier on. Um, you know, a lot, one of the mistakes that a lot of people do that um, is, I think is fairly common, you know, getting two sets of tangos and a health potion, or in this case, getting one set of runes of blight, pardon me, not tangos. Some of those Dota terms just um, die. You can't teach, what is it? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Dead, old habits die hard. Whatever it is, tangos, runes of blight, same thing. Um, you know, given that he's a healer, you really don't need both of them in, in most cases. If this Pebbles was maybe a little bit more aggressive, it could have been possible. So Demented Shaman worked great mid for a plethora of reasons. Most notably, though, he works as pretty much a hard carry for any melee hero because he has a nice long attack range sitting at 550, not, not quite up to that 600. But he's so great against a melee hero for what we just saw right there. They get near the creeps and you just drop that heal bomb. It makes it so difficult for your opponent to farm. We see Pebbles is 7 and 2, Demented Shaman 11 and 2. So this Pebbles is actually doing a pretty good job picking up some of those last hits, but it is costing him. He is out of his regeneration and he is low on health. Demented Shaman, meanwhile, has a ton of regen left and still has, um, you know, a, a lot of mana, a lot of health. He's in good shape. He's farming better than Pebbles and he's keeping Pebbles out of the lane. He's harassing him very effectively for a ranged intellect hero. Demented Shaman has a relatively high base damage. It's actually got a pretty big range, but still relatively high comparatively. You see, we see Pebbles actually in pretty big trouble. He throws that stun. One of the mistakes that Pebbles makes in this game uh, is that he's not aggressive enough. If we actually run this back just a pinch here, Pebbles actually could have killed Demented Shaman right here pretty easily, at least in my humble opinion. He throws the stun, and if he had moved in to get aggressive and dropped the chuck on the Demented Shaman, 
He might have been able to finish him off, although it's risky business because he would have gotten heal bombed. But we see he ends up dying here anyway. Catlow main picks up an easy kill on to Pebbles. And again, that looked like a worse of a play than it actually was. One of the great things about Demented Shaman mid also is that it catches people off guard quite frequently. You see from this lineup on the Hellborn team, as, as someone on the Legion team, you know, we talked earlier on about picking your starting items based on what your opponent is going to do in the mid lane. So as Pebbles, he's thinking, okay, am I going to need a stout shield? He probably would have thought Dampier would go mid. So he's thinking, no, I don't need a, or an Iron Buckler, rather. I don't need a Buckler because I'm not going to get out harassed by Dampier. I will harass him more effectively, hence I don't need it. That's probably something similar to the line of thought that Pebbles was going through in his mind. You don't normally think of Demented Shaman as a solo mid hero, so it works great for that surprise factor as well. It makes it much harder for people to try and think, okay, well, who am I going to be up against mid? Okay, well, most people instantly cross off Demented Shaman. So you have a little bit of a surprise factor there. You'll see melee heroes not pick up that shield, and if they do, it's you know for reasons like they just do it by habit, and it happens to counter you just a little bit. It still works very effectively. See, Pebbles still does not have his bottle, so he moves down here to pick up this Illusion Rune. And this is arguably a little bit of a mistake. Let's pause and take a look at um, you know, what, who has sight of what. So our Hellborn team, Demented Shaman, Cat Lomain team, they don't have any wards up of the rune whatsoever. We see nothing around here up in the top lane. Down in the bottom, they've got nothing. So he's running blind, but he does not care about runes all that much. Demented Shaman, one of these heroes that just wants to stay in the lane and put constant pressure on the lane. Pebbles has one rune ward down here. Or no, pardon me, it's the other way around. Gosh, I'm so sorry. I totally had that backwards. The, the ward down here is for the Hellborn team. Total, total brain fart, pardon me. So Demented Shaman has the rune. Pebbles goes down here and picks up this Illusion rune. So this is a particularly risky play from Pebbles. I'm really sorry, that was really... I, I was confusing myself. Total, total brain fart. So... Pebbles actually makes a really big mistake here. This is such a this is a risky play in disguise. So we see Pebbles moves on down here. He's like, all right, I'm gonna try to get the rune. He's guessing bottom lane for a rune. If he had a bottle right now, this wouldn't be the worst play ever because he could fill up the bottle if he guesses right, go back up to full mana, full health, and maybe harass down the Mented Shaman a bit more and get a little bit of lane control. But he doesn't even have a bottle. Given that it's an illusion rune, that's basically useless for him right now. And that whole time he's left the lane, he is now two levels behind. Demented Shaman. If we take a look at the farm differential, Pebbles at 142, Demented Shaman at 325. That is a huge differential in the way of farm. XP per minute is the same exact way. Pebbles just struggling so much. And a lot of that comes from poor decision making and uh, not the best starting items. We see uh, Pebbles going to get taken out here for a second time. A little bit of a dive from Cat Lomain. And uh, Pebbles actually just falls to the uh, entangled dot thanks to the ultimate of Demented Shaman. One thing I want to point out that Cat Lomain does very wisely here is getting the ultimate at level 6. Stormcloud, one of the most underestimated ultimates in this game. Of course, a lot of people understand how powerful it is. We see it picked up all the time. People always say, oh, Demented Shaman ultimate is the tide turner and fights. Yes indeed it is but too frequently we see people going for this uh, entangle heal build they just go back and forth level 8 have both of them max I think level 6 stormcloud is still unbelievably good we also demented shaman make a little bit of a blunder here but this is actually great so what did we just see here I mentioned this earlier on all right, we got to wait for Rhapsody thing to go away because that's too obnoxious. So what did we talk about earlier on? We said sometimes it's effective to help your mid, to roam up and just help your mid set up a gang. That's exactly what we saw right there. Demented Shaman is one such hero, kind of like Soul Stealer. He doesn't have a good escape mechanism, although he can heal, although usually they'll level up Unbreakable early on. He's still very susceptible to ganks in the early stages. Drop two stuns. Not a hell of a lot he can do, down he goes. And we saw it demonstrated very clearly right there with that Rhapsody Pebbles uh, combination. So that was great. That was a great reaction from Rhapsody. Pebbles is like, guys, I'm really struggling mid. He's killed me twice. This is really bad. Demented Shaman's owning me. Rhapsody says, you know what, buddy? I'm going to come help you out. And they come and set up a gank. And now Pebbles is going to have this opportunity to free farm. Let's see how it plays out. So we go back to the game. Now Pebbles is able to turn this around a little bit. That XP per minute has turned around a little bit. He's not as far behind as he was, and the differential is only going to grow as he stays in the lane. And Demented Shaman is still not back in the mid lane. In the uh, gold per minute, Pebbles still pretty far behind, but again, slowly catching up. Demented Shaman slowly deteriorating, and Pebbles just 
slowly getting up there as he continues to pick up kills on this creep. So Demented Shaman comes back into lane, and now it's a little bit more evened out. Rhapsody it was the saving grace for this mid lane. I mean, Pebbles is still losing, but not at such a significant margin. So don't be afraid to help that mid lane. Set up those ganks, especially on a hero that has no clear escape mechanism. You know, if there's a Valkyrie mid, might be kind of hard to set up an early gank, but someone like Demented Shaman who can only run, even though he has a heal, you can still gank him pretty damn effectively. Don't be afraid to do it, it works very well, and don't flame your mid hero just because he gets killed in the early stages. Not everyone is going to win mid, but that doesn't mean the game is lost. You don't have to win the mid lane in a 1v1 scenario to win the game. Your team can support you, and you can turn it around despite having a rocky start in the mid lane. Unfortunately, none of the other lanes are really going well for the Legion team in this match either, but, um, you know, that doesn't matter right now. We're just focused on mid lane. So there's a nice haste rune down in the bottom. Demented Shaman going to try and slow down Pebbles, and uh, I think Cat Lomain's going to be able to pick this one up. Uh, actually, maybe he doesn't, if I remember correctly. Oh, indeed, Pebbles picks it up. Unfortunately, Pebbles was unable to bottle it, though, which is really unfortunate. So now he's probably going to be forced back to the well. Again, very unfortunate indeed for old Pebbles. He just can't catch a break if only he could have bottled it. So now Emerald Warden's going to come in. He's like, all right, I got this, Pebbles. I got this. I'm going to farm up mid now. I'm going to push back this Demented Shaman who's farming so well. By the way, Demented Shaman's farm has dipped off a little bit. Um, you know, his XP is still way leagues ahead as everyone on that Legion team has been rotating mid. I want to talk about the items in the inventory of Demented Shaman as well, most notably Ring of the Teacher. Now, I mentioned Demented Shaman is one of these heroes that wants to stay in lane so that he can put constant pressure, and that's what he's doing right here. He probably could have pushed this lane even more effectively if he had used that heal a little bit more efficiently, but this next wave is going to come in, and this tower is already dangerously low. Part of the reason he's able to push so effectively is that Ring of the Teacher, of course, adding the armor to creeps, and we've heard this argument so many times, people saying, all right, you turn your ring off so the lane doesn't push, and then once the, you want to push a lane, you turn the ring on so the creeps can survive longer. And I've also heard some people say, no, no, that's, I mean, that's such a negligible difference. Who cares? It's not a big deal. It makes a pretty big difference because it allows the creeps to survive one more tower hit. All things equal, this stage in the game, you have that ring of the teacher on creeps. They smack the tower. They're smacking the tower. A creep can tank the tower for four hits or five, I actually can't remember how many it is, but the mitigated damage from that extra armor, that extra three armor, allows the creeps to survive an extra tower hit. So it buys you quite a bit more time of auto attacking. We're gonna see this mid tower fall while Pebbles is running around. So we're gonna take a look at what Pebbles did while Demented Shaman was able to push this mid tower. A very similar situation to what we saw in the last game with uh, Hag able to push that tower when Pyro was ganking. So we see Pebbles went back to the well, and Pebbles is going to do this same thing that we saw in these previous games. He's going to leave Demented Shaman mid and say, okay, I'm struggling really hard in the mid lane. I'm really far behind. What can I do to turn this around? All right, I'm going to go gank another lane. That'll get me back on track. I'll pick up a kill. I'll you know run mid, maybe get the rune down in the bottom lane, and I'll be in good shape. It's close to that eight-minute mark. I can do this. Let's go. The little train that could. So what is he giving up though? What is the opportunity cost of doing that? He's going to let Demented Shaman push a tower. So it's a 4v2 down here. Let's see if this is a cost effective exchange for Pebbles. I guess for the team in general. They're going to be able to take down Ra and proc his ultimate. Uh, no, they're not. Oh my gosh. I thought they would have been able to do that. So wow, this is a, actually a great example. So they are able to finally take down Ra. Will they be able to kill him again? It looks like uh, it's, it's looking promising. So they take him down. Orange is able to pick up the kill. Orange uh, getting dangerously low is barely going to able to survive. Monarch could have finished off that kill, but he didn't. He didn't. He could have, but he didn't. So what did Pebbles gain from that? The tower in the mid is just about to fall. Down it goes. Let's pause it and take a look at the numbers, guys. Actually, let's give him a second to adjust here. So now look at this gold differential. Demented Shaman up at 320. Pebbles still at 180. Again, more proof that it's not good to leave that lane open and just allow it to be pushed, especially against a hero like Demented Shaman. So right now in this game, the Hellborn team is probably thinking, all right, Demented Shaman went pretty well because all of their lanes went on. No one right now is like, oh, my lane is awful. We need your help, Demented Shaman. Please gank. You're so bad for not ganking. So they're probably not flaming him too much. But... We see how it pays off. Even if one of these other lanes for the Hellborn team wasn't doing well, even if this Dampyr Glacius lane was backed up against their own tower and they weren't doing anything and Dampyr wasn't farming, it still is more effective for Demented Shaman just to wait for Pebbles to leave that lane and just push that early tier 1 tower. Because that gold that your team is going to get 
will make up for that early difference of Dampier not getting that that great of farm early on. You know, he's not farming the first eight minutes. Demented Shaman can get a tower kill in the mid within ten minutes. It makes up that differential. And if you have a lane that's winning, it makes that lane that's winning even that much more effective. So it's really important important thing to consider, and it's very clearly demonstrated by Cat Lomain in this game. But we see how powerful Demented Shaman can be. I mean, he completely pooped on Pebbles. See that double damage and easy peasy kill, a nice freeze from Glacius, but still, Demented Shaman doing very well. And then you can just continue to build Demented Shaman in a very support-oriented way. You can go into the carry Demented Shaman, which doesn't work quite as well, but getting even those early support items, getting a nice fast Abyssal Skull, some plated greaves, maybe even a fast Souls Bulwark if no one else on your team feels Souls Bulwark savvy. A lot of things you can do. It opens a lot of doors, and you can push so effectively. Another great replay for us. So um, that actually is about all that I have. It's It's been a, a good breakdown, but that kind of brings us to an end here. So again, the main takeaways from this solo mid in the lower pubs, what did we learn from looking at these higher-level players in their solo matchmaking games? is make sure you control the runes, and we established that rune control doesn't necessarily mean your mid-hero getting a bottle and picking up every single rune. It means making sure your team knows who has the rune, whether it's on your team or the other, what rune it is, what they're going to do with it, and at the same time, using your team efforts to control the rune, not just letting that sole responsibility fall on the mid-hero. The mid-hero cannot do everything at once. Takeaway number two, it is okay to help your mid-hero gank that lane, especially if the hero is easily susceptible to gank someone without an escape mechanism. Just roam up there and help him out, especially if you're a support hero like Rapsi or Glacius, move in there, drop a disable. Chances are you'll be able to kill that mid-hero, and then your mid-hero's one mid. That's great. He's a level up, getting all that free farm, and your team is on the path to victory. Takeaway number three is never expect your mid-hero to gank at every single opportunity. We've established through three different replays that more often than not, it is not cost-effective for your mid-hero to leave that lane for the chance at picking up a kill. Very rarely can you say, yes, if you leave this lane, we will 100% kill one of these heroes up in the top. Very rarely is that the case. You're going up there for the chance of getting the kill. So you have to look at that opportunity cost. What am I giving up in the mid? I'm giving up all of that experience, all of that gold, and I'm also allowing my opponent all of that additional gold because he's basically free farming. And in some opportunities, you're also allowing them to put some pressure on your tower. If they can get it down to half health very quickly, it makes them for an easy push later on for the next couple of runes. And what are you gaining? Just the chance of picking up a kill. And even if you get that kill, is that little bit of golden experience worth all of the free farm you handed to your opponent in the mid lane? Very deep topics to think about. So it's been a pleasure, guys. I think Sneaky and myself may cast a little bit. I can't believe this breakdown went for an hour and a half. I thought this would be a nice quick one for us. But it wasn't. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, we are going to do another breakdown on Sunday. We're probably going to look at a replay from the tournament. The It's Ghost to February Open number one is coming up this weekend. I think registration for that bad boy just closed. So it's going to be a great tournament. Sneaky and myself will be casting yet again. I think she's uh, had fun on vacation but ready to get back to work. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, I'm going to post this VOD in a nice, timely manner. And uh, take care. Be kind to yourselves. Be kind to each other. Be kind to your mid heroes. There's nothing more fucking frustrating than getting flamed when you just want to play a nice, casual, demented shaman mid game. Take care, guys. And we will see you later on, at the very least, tomorrow at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the It's Go Suhan channel.